Can you hear me? Is this loud enough if I speak more or less at this volume? Everyone can hear? Okay. So in lots of respects, obviously this has been a momentous year. And partly because of that, I, it seems like a good moment to declare an anniversary. It is, as some, as you know, some of you know, the 10th anniversary of Creative Commons. I think we're all very grateful that they've decided to celebrate that here tonight. But I also want to claim this as a broader anniversary. The international community of scholars and activists who work on these issues is also roughly a decade old. Many of the institutions working in this area were founded around a decade ago. Our hosts, the Center for Technology and Society at FGV, are a decade old next year. EDRI in Brussels is 10, public knowledge in the US is 11, so is the Sarai Group in Delhi, so is the Samuelson Clinic at Berkeley, and a bunch of the Geneva NGOs, including ICS, ICTSD, started engaging systematically with IP issues around then too. So 10 years later, we appear to be at a point where many of the issues that motivate us are moving from the periphery of political debates to the center. And so it seems like a good time to pause and reflect on that trajectory to see what it can tell us about where we are going and trying to go. So I'm very pleased that this next portion of the day is devoted to just that. And I'm very pleased that we'll have an opportunity to hear from several of the people who have committed themselves to these issues over years and in some cases decades and who have shaped the larger community in which many of us have worked. We'll get a chance to hear from Peter Yazi of American University, Jamie Love of Knowledge Ecology International, Vera Franz of the Open Society Foundation, Paul Keller of Knowledge Land and Creative Commons, and Herman Velasquez of the South Center. And I really look forward to hearing from them because we almost never take the time collectively, and so if, if, if occasionally more often individually, to stop and look back and understand where we've been. And since this is a keynote partly repurposed to provide an introduction to this session, I do want to spend a little time outlining what, to me at least, have been a few important ways of thinking about this longer arc. This longer arc of work and also the role of the Global Congress within it. And in an important sense, the Global Congress is just the latest platform for this community, or more properly, community of communities, to talk and strategize. For the past decade or so, someone has always played that role. Not just convening, but acting as a kind of network of networks, a tent pole around which other groups can build and work and also convene. So before the Global Congresses, there were the Access to Knowledge Conferences at Yale, and we have several of the organizers of that set of events here with us. iCommons has also played a big role over the years. How many of you have heard of the Bellagio Dialogues on intellectual property? How many of you have at attended one or more of the Bellagio Dialogues? Okay, so, so just a couple of you. I realize this is hard to read. You don't have to read it right now, but well. <laughs> I ask because I don't think the story of this field can be told without some mention of the work of the Rockefeller Foundation and of program officers like Carolyn Deere, Anthony So, and Jake Worksman who led a kind of covert operation within the foundation to build and fund a public interest policy sector on IP issues starting around 2001. And that strategy was built around a series of workshops in Bellagio, Italy held between 2002 and 2005 on what they and their networks identified as key challenges for international IP governance. And Rockefeller then poured a lot of money into the plans that came out of those conversations. Not all of it worked, but the accomplishments and to a large extent the networks are still with us a decade later. One of the most important aspects of this work was to shift the efforts of a number of Geneva NGOs to work on IP issues. There's a long sort of alphabet soup of, of NGOs in this, in this category. Uh, ICTSD is one of them. Uh, in a related capacity, the South Center played a role. This was the network that in a sense recolonized WIPO and made it, if not a force for good exactly, at least a force capable of doing less harm. And if you're, if you're wondering why, this, why Bellagio is a reference here, Bellagio was an hour from Geneva. It was also where the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation owned a kind of palace slash conference center. 
So it provided a very good place for building the capacity and bringing in uh, official representatives from WIPO and other, other Geneva-based organizations that were involved in IP governance. So most of the major initiatives of the period passed through Bellagio in some fashion. The development agenda, later the A2K treaty discussions, the research and development treaty at the WHO, a lot of work on medicines and open science, not much work on digital copyright to some extent. That, was, that, that became more of a, a, a central concern a little bit later in the, in, uh, than was easy to accommodate in the Bellagio framework. Given the resistance to this policy work within the Rockefeller Foundation, it was astonishing that it happened at all. And everything we've done, to a large extent, hinges on some very fragile moments of institutional activism within a few foundations. And that's a point I want to come back to. So throughout, the goal was to help groups build a positive ag agenda on intellectual property, focused on ways in which changes to IP policy could expand access to health, food security, development, and a host of other issues. So the Global Congress is hardly the first to propose that we focus on a positive agenda, on constructing good outcomes instead of simply avoiding the bad. And as we've heard several times this morning, public interest advocacy work tends to be reactive, in large part because it almost always operates at a huge resource disadvantage. It's usually about stopping the next bad thing or mitigating the damages of the current one. This is the default setting. So Bellagio Dialogues and now Global Congresses offer some precious time to think about the future and how to build toward positive policy change. I'm very happy that the Global Congress can be part of that process. But since we'll hear a lot about positive agendas in the next few days, I do want to spare a moment to praise the negative agenda, the long fight to block bad IP law. And I want to do so not just because it's important to avoid this or that bad outcome, but because delay is a viable strategy. And I would argue it may be the most important strategy. So a decade of delay means that we now have a generation of digital natives above or nearing voting age. And they have very different attitudes toward most of these issues than even those a decade older. Here's one way that we've described this difference in some recent work. 76% of Americans under 30 view sharing music files with friends as reasonable. Among all others, it's around 50%. Only 37% of those under 30 support penalties for downloading. The current policy environment is based on a very fragile, bare majority in most cases, minority in others. If you look at Germany, the same number. The age divides are even sharper. In Poland, if you look at some of the work done recently by Mirek Felisiak and Alec Tarkowski, they're sharper still. There's a major generational shift around these issues. The young favor more relaxed norms of use and are anxious about measures that appear to threaten the internet as they know it, as a vehicle for a wide range of relatively unhindered forms of self-expression, utilization, and acquisition of media. So that's the good news. The negative agenda has not only paid off, it has gotten much more powerful over time. And I think this is fundamentally what we saw with SOPA and ACTA in the last year, massive negative reactions that far surpassed anything that we expected. And I, I think I can genuinely say we, all of us, and it just was just astonishing to watch play out. But can it be translated into a positive agenda? And that is harder. It's harder to build and harder to rally around. I don't think we'll see an internet blackout day anytime soon in favor of expanding fair use or addressing the abuse of notice and takedown procedures. I think the failure of the Marco Seville bill here that Pedro just told us about illustrates how hard it is to organize in favor of good law on these issues. The bad news is that the first strong internet rights bill fell to industry pressure. The good news is that it almost passed, and that's kind of incredible. And it will surely be back. So even in defeat, I think we should offer congratulations to our FGV hosts who spent so much time and energy to take it this far. So the negative agenda is looking strong, but the positive agenda faces serious challenges. And I will conclude by discussing another. You're looking at a chart of the boom and bust cycle in philanthropic funding for this work. We're now in the bust phase of the cycle. 
The Bellagio Dialogues were part of a flood of foundation interest in these issues starting in the early 2000s. The Rockefeller Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, OSI, later the Ford Foundation, they all channeled money into both advocacy and activist. Some of the funders channeled money into research, especially development agencies like IDRC and DFID. All of it built institutional capacity and expertise on these issues. So there's a bottom-up story of the recent wins right, that, that hinges largely on generational change. But I'd also argue that there's an important top-down account and here I'm not referring to Google conspiracy theories, although I don't discount the importance of Google and other tech sector lobbying in the recent SOPA fight. Rather, I'd emphasize the growth of, a, of public interest programs and NGOs that have now produced a generation of alumni engaged with these issues and who now operate in a much wider array of positions of influence, from journalists to tech sector lawyers to conservative free culture nerds. And I think that's why we're at a tipping point, where the bottom up and the top down are largely in sync. And the great danger, in my view, is that these wins are building off the accumulated investment in institutions and, and people from the past decade, and that that infrastructure is now running on fumes. Ford, Rockefeller, and MacArthur all left the field by 2008 for two principal reasons. New leadership in those organizations saw IP advocacy as a contentious, no-win struggle against powerful industries. When picking their fights, they picked other fights. The second is a more personal one. The program staff at those foundations didn't succeed in institutionalizing their work. IP portfolios remained personalistic. The funding for the entire field hinged on around 10 people. And so at some point it fell apart. And then we started winning. <laughs> So IDRC is the only major research funder left, and it has seen its budget cut in the past two years. OSI has remained, OSF has remained the only steady source of advocacy funding almost since the beginning, and we can largely thank Vera Franz for that. The new entrant is, of course, Google, which has emerged as an important funder of both research and advocacy. Google isn't on this chart because I didn't have enough confidence in my numbers. I'm pretty sure that their absence doesn't significantly change the story for the things that we would call research convening and public advocacy, although that could change. And I'm pretty sure that there aren't other tech funders who have a significant influence on this larger story. So this is a very rough chart and it almost certainly misses a few things, but generally speaking, this has been a struggle for evidence-based IP policy on the cheap, peaking at maybe $15 million a year in external support globally. Now we're probably around half that. And so I close with that cautionary note. Collectively, we are, we are at a moment of great promise, but also great fragility. With so few funders in the field, there is some risk of a funding monoculture. And a Google monoculture in particular would be problematic, regardless of their intentions or policies. There is also some risk that the resource crisis of the field could force a retreat to the few well-resourced law schools and nonprofits that have some independent staying power. That would also be a serious problem, first because there are very few of those institutions outside the US and Europe, and second because both research and public interest advocacy have benefited enormously from the diversification of the field in recent years. I don't have an answer to those dilemmas. I am consoled by the fact that we get to have this crisis when we're winning. And I'm thrilled to see so many people that I don't know here. And if this is your first such gathering, welcome. You're the community now. It's a pretty easy club to get into. <laughs> and a pretty rewarding one. So on that note, I wish you all again a happy anniversary and a fun and productive Global Congress.